is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lockwood. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lockwood here in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Risk returns, a rebound in Chinese shares pushes global stocks higher as unrest over COVID curbs eases amid a heavy police presence. Tightening till to all the Fed officials stress the need for more hikes to break scorching inflation, even if at a slower pace. Plus, Musk rounds on Apple, the billionaire owner of Twitter, a taxi iPhone maker, and a flurry of tweets risking ties with a top advertiser. Now, first thing is first, we do have some interesting stories we need to get to, but this is what the picture looks like for the markets. Again, two tenths of 8% for European stocks. Look, there's a very clear move into risky assets after some of the concerns that we had over China and some of the protests yesterday. And the contribution, of course, of China to the world economy abated somewhat. China said it would bolster also vaccination amongst its senior citizens. And then we had some pretty encouraging figures in terms of CPI in Spain. And that's changing what we look at in terms of bond markets. We'll get to yields overall in Europe shortly. Crude oil, 7902. This WTI, I could also be looking at Brent. And then S&P 500 futures gaining five-tenths of 8%. Now, the European map, if you look at some of the affinities or not with the energy crisis and the proximity to Russia, you can see the UK gaining seven-tenths of 8%. We have a really interesting story on the Bloomberg terminal about house prices, certainly that prime House prices, according to an index by Knight Frank, will go down 3% in the UK. Dubai taking that top spot. And then you can see the DAX and the FTSE MIB over in Italy pretty much unchanged. Now, Bloomberg's Chief Asia Economics Correspondent, Enda Kern, joins us in all of the news related to China and what we've seen over the last couple of days. Enda, thank you so much for joining us. How should we look at China? How should we look at the contribution China going forward will, will do to the world economy? Well, we had news today, Francine, that the government is going to target the elderly population in particular for vaccinations. It's, it's going to push vaccines among this part of the population, especially in nursing homes. They will use the data to identify uh, who does need a vaccine or a booster shot because that part of the population, those that are aged 80 and above, are among the under-vaccinated in China's population. Now, the government today stopped short, however, enforcing mandates or providing specific details of how they're going to do this. But the point of it all is, analysts are saying this shows you that China is now on a road, a long road, out of COVID-0. Eventually, they are preparing to make that journey. Uh, that's why we saw markets respond the way they did today. A big rally in individual shares linked to uh, vaccines, for example, and, of course, a broader rally that the economy, economy might start to pick up. So it was obviously, of course, uh, the backdrop being those protests in recent days that would have certainly not have gone unnoticed by the government, met with a fairly stiff police response. But the net takeaway, I think, for most people watching the China story today is that it's a small incremental step on what's going to be probably a, a long and maybe complicated journey for China to transition away from its COVID-0 policies and back towards reopening and connect, connecting its economy with the world. So, and how, how difficult is it to actually game theory what happens in China? We know that they're using police sensors and, you know, and other uh, tactics to avoid some of the protests. Do you assume that protests will, will slowly peter out? Well, politically speaking, we know there's always going to be a very tough response to protests in China. What, we, what our colleagues were reporting on over the past few days is quite unprecedented, Francine, and it was met with that stiff police response. There are other factors at play as well. Our colleagues were saying, for example, there's sub-zero freezing cold temperatures in Beijing probably played a role in all of that. We'll need to see how the protests play out over coming days and, and the weekend in, in, in particular. But the bigger point is that... There is, there is some signs now that the government is trying to tweak its COVID-0 strategy, at least move away from some of the, the rolling cycle of lockdowns and restrictions, try and let the economy get back on its feet, and, of course, to let people get around and improve mobility. That seems to be the takeaway from the steps in recent days. All right, let's also bring uh, Janet Moy of Bruin Dolphin, um, head of market analysis there, RBC Bruin Dolphin. Janet, w when you look at China, and you're, uh, of course, a, uh, also a China expert, and you've, you know, given us insight over the last 10 years, is this a pivot point for, for the Chinese economy on, on how actually, how many vaccinations they'll do for um, the, the older members of the public and what it means for the world economy? Hi, Francie. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we think this is quite a pivotal uh, moment because we haven't really seen this kind of uh, broadcasted uh, widespread protest in China. So I think uh, p the people have spoken. 
it's been too long and I think the officials, I think they got the message and that's why we got the you know, press conference today, a bit of softening in the tone. So we think the overall direction is still, you know, gradually easing that uh, very strict COVID zero strategy. So it is a good thing, but it is going to be done, in, you know, a two, two step forward, one yeah. step back kind of process. It's not, never going to be easy and the market will be very, very sensitive to the developments. But overall, I think it's a positive trend. So, Janet, overall, what does it mean for China's contribution to the world economy? Are you also expecting less lockdowns going forward, or how does that develop? Yeah, I think if um, the, the current situation stands, we do expect that the lockdowns will be more infrequent because there is a macro and the top-down guidance of gradually easing policies. And I think the regional officials also get that. So we expect uh, more, more easing measures, more, you know, more activity uh, going forward from the consumer side of things. Services side has been absolutely hampered by the zero COVID strategy. So it will be very positive domestically. And from a global perspective, you know, there has been a lot of concerns on the ongoing disruption to global supply chains. Yeah. I think that will alleviate the, that concern and that would help to further dampen that global goods inflation story. And so, Jen, overall, does it directly impact, you know, energy in the immediate term? So is it oil and energy prices or is it just the supply chains that we need to look at? Yeah, I think um, so. We have seen oil prices slumping basically in the past months or so. And I think a big part of that is due to China still not reopening. But I think if there is more concrete evidence that China is going back, uh, back to its normal it, it will be very positive for the uh, commodity sector, especially energy and also gas. Uh, we both seen prices slumping yeah. quite a lot. Um, so it will be short term positive, but longer term factors, of course, that still depends on you know, the Russian side of things, the OPEC uh, supply side of things. But yeah, it will be positive for the oil and gas. So, Jan, overall, are, are we reaching peak inflation? I know there's like, you know, you can see peak inflation, mm -hmm. but core inflation being very, very sticky. Mm -hmm. And is this the point where finally the market realizes what Fed officials have been trying to say that maybe they'll ease off, but you know the trend is definitely higher interest rates. Yeah, we do think that uh, we are seeing peak in inflation. We are seeing that in the UK, uh, US, in in terms of the headline, the core is still very sticky. But eventually, that would also turn because of the slowing uh, housing market. First of all, that will have a more significant impact on demand, general demand next year. We're not seeing that yet, but next year probably more noticeably. And uh, we think there are many leading indicators that tell us inflation is peaking. You see, uh, basically, producer prices slowing across the world, food yep. prices slowing, all the commodity complex slowing from the peak. Uh, you know, the strong dollar is very supportive for the imported goods side of things. And eventually we're going to see a slower labor market. So I think all that points to some sort of slowing inflation uh, in next year. And uh, I, I know you've written some wonderful analysis, of course, on central banks and some of the challenges uh, going ahead looking into 2023. What kind of juncture do you think? I don't know whether we're at crossroads because there's a belief in the markets that actually inflation will come down and that's not exactly the message we're hearing from central banks. No, I think that's the biggest question for Francine for next year. There is a view that we've passed peak inflation, certainly maybe in food prices and in certain commodity prices. Obviously, the European energy crisis is a standout from that, though. But the big question is, is less about it has inflation peaked. Where does inflation come back to? Does it plateau at a high level or does it come back to somewhere that the central banks are comfortable with, somewhere near those those mandate targets that they all have to observe. That's probably one of the biggest questions. And that, by extension, will dictate where, of course, interest rates go and where people's mortgages will go next year. And that, of course, will dictate a lot of, you know, the whole consumer animal spirit story and the pressure in the housing market that we've seen across the developed world, especially this year. So I think there is a lot of focus on, I think, less about the peak inflation story, but where does it come back to? Does it settle at a high level or come back down to where central banks want it? That's the big unknown yep. for next year. Yeah, and Jen, if you look at that big unknown, of course, how do you play that on the markets? Do you just go into, into bonds? Yeah, so uh, in terms of equities versus bond, we think that bonds are more attractive than equities at the moment because I think markets are pricing in a lot of interest rate increases yeah. already. Basically, we're not, you know, the bulk of that interest rate increases has happened and yeah. we're not far from the peak, basically. You know, you can speculate whether it's, you know, in the US is five or five and a quarter percent, but we're nearly there. So we think that bonds overvalue, especially, you know, uh, the yield curve is flashing the, these recession signals and uh, it's our base case that there is going to be a recession sometime next year in the US. So bonds would, would be a, you know, a asset class that perform in that sort of environment. And equities, where we, we don't have a strong conviction no. yet because uh, we think that the earnings downgrade uh, and the recession next year is going to you know, potentially hamper equities further. Uh
All right, thank you so much. Janet Moy there, Head of Market Analysis at RBC, Bruin Dolphin, and Bloomberg's Chief Asia Economics Correspondent, Enda Kern. In terms of market moves, also watch out for European yields. That in Spanish inflation number actually eased more than expected, and that will probably give a nice a little boost for the ECB, reinforcing expectations for a wider slowdown in European prices and maybe offering some comfort to governments. Coming up, Twitter boss Elon Musk says Apple has cut back its advertising on the social network, so we'll have plenty more that story next and this is Bloomberg. Finance politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, BlockFi has become the latest crypto casualty as it files for bankruptcy, citing FTX exposure, with the FT reporting it's suing the FTX founder, Sam Bankman Fried. Now, joining us now is Anna Herrera, our senior crypto editor. Anna, I mean, first of all, it feels like every day, every week, maybe not every day, but every week, there's something going wrong with a part of someone that had exposure to a crypto market. So, what's happening with BlockFi? So BlockFi wasn't doing well already because they they were exposed to the fall in prices, obviously, because they're a lender. They were bailed out by FTX, and we know that now FTX needed a bailout, and they, they've gone bankrupt. So obviously they're exposed to FTX, and that's sort of what, what drove them to, the, to their bankruptcy. And clearly, obviously, they're probably not the, not the last because they had their own counterparties, and we've not been able to see from sort of their filing who their major counterparties are. I think we saw the SEC is, sorry, creditors. We saw um, the SEC is one of their major creditors, which is, which is funny, and I guess, in a way. But still, there might be more, more dominoes to fall when we figure out who the other um, counterparties and creditors might be. So what's the market reaction? You're right. This is like an ecosystem, right? So the, it's lenders. It's, it's, they're all intertwined. How difficult is it to find out who's next? Yeah, you'd think that it'd be easier because of blockchain, you know, blockchain transparency, everything is there. But but really, like, a lot of these exchanges and centralized institutions are sort of like black holes. You don't really see what's going on. So it's it's hard until, you know, you actually see the creditors list to figure out who was exposed or if they come out and say some firms have said we were exposed. But obviously, like, it tends to be the ones that where maybe the exposure isn't completely, like, uh, too big or, you know, it, it, where they want to minimize contagion. I, I, we don't know really if keeping the names, you know, uh, cut, not, not open is actually helpful or not, because in a way it might, like, slow down. People might be thinking, who do I trust now? And so that might be stalling things. So are you expecting more pain until, and I don't know how, that, how much that how long that pain lasts until we find out who the last domino is yeah we, we don't really know this this has really started earlier on this year so it's actually continuing since since may we had a bit of a lull in pain but it's back now we were watching genesis last week they were raising money and they said if we don't raise money we might file so obviously we're, we're trying to figure out and trying to wait and see if they raise money or if they're going to file as well all right and i think so much Anna Herrera, they're our senior crypto editor now from crypto to Twitter. Elon Musk has tweeted that Apple has mostly stopped advertising on Twitter. A few minutes later, the Twitter chief claimed Apple might boot Twitter from its app store. Now, for more, we're joined by Bloomberg's Giles Turner. Giles, I mean, so much drama in the Twitter sphere. And what is this? Is this Elon Musk just baiting and picking fights? I get a feeling that he's come into the office and realized that Apple gets a 30% commission for all the money that he can possibly make uh, via the app store because. The real problem is Twitter needs to make money, right? Yeah. He's bought this for a huge amount of money. It doesn't make a huge amount of profit, if any. He wants to charge $8 for yeah. every user to use Twitter, and Apple's going to get 30% if he ends up managing to charge people you know, $8. So he's realized this and thought, I need to take them on. But all this has been done before. Epic uh, Games yes. has had a huge fight with Apple, went to the law courts. This is the time in 2019. This is the company that made Fortnite. Every, every kid was playing that game you know, on, on their mobile, uh, and they lost, right? And so let's see if you know, Elon Musk, is he going to go to the courts again, or is he going to try and bully Apple? It's very hard to bully the biggest company in the world, so it's going to be a fascinating yeah. fight. I mean, is Apple also a huge advertiser on Twitter, so does it impact revenue on that front? Yeah, Apple's one of the biggest advertisers on Twitter. Um, I think it's a huge amount. Uh, they do advertise. Uh, most of Twitter's revenue comes from advertising as well. I think it's about $4.1 last year. Yeah. Uh, Apple, I mean, we saw on the Twitter fight, Apple's pulling back from advertising. So is everyone else, right? They're not the only one. So this is a huge problem for them. So do, does he, does Elon Musk have any leverage in the I, I think the he has some. 
Um, it helps owning Twitter, for example, a uh, place that most people like to pick a fight. Uh, but also, Apple doesn't advertise on Facebook, for example. I mean, Apple's got an amazing advertising machine. Uh, but it did really focus on Twitter. Uh, and so pulling back from that, I'm sure they'll find ways of selling their, their goods. They don't have a problem with that. But still, it's not a great fight to pick. Um, Jazz, overall, I mean, I you know, you know, watch Twitter all the time. And it's, it's really Elon Musk tweeting like 24-7. Is this working? Is it too early to say whether people are, are leaving the platform or coming back to the, to the platform? Like, it's unclear exactly what's happening right now. Well, he says it's going great. But I guess he would say that. But I think with this particular fight, this is a really good fight for him to pick because lawmakers both in Europe and the US don't like Apple charging 30%. Yeah. It's a gatekeeper. They think it should be fairer. Uh, this, is a, this is a fight that he could potentially win because he's got a lot of especially Republican lawmakers on his side with this. Yeah. And you can see him doing plenty of lobbying in the politics sphere with the upcoming US election. So maybe this is all part of that. And maybe this is the fight he could potentially win or at least bring down that 30% figure. I mean, he would have known this before, right? That they charged 30% because of the epic fight. I I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 I couldn't say. Sometimes I get the feeling he comes in every morning, learns a new thing, you know, and then, and then says it on Twitter. Uh, so I don't, I can't say. All right, Giles, thank you so much, as always, for your insight. Uh, Giles Turner there from our media and tech team. Now, the other thing we're watching is European football. Mm. Yes, this is Juventus plunged into crisis uh, this morning after the chairman, but also the entire board resigned amid a probe into alleged wrongdoing related to the company's last three financial findings. Also coming up, Paul Machatile uh, tipped to be the next deputy leader of South Africa's governing African National Congress. He already holds three of the party's top positions. We'll get his views on reviving the economy. This is Bloomberg. Inflation's been stubborner than, than I would like. And I don't start with the idea of a rate path. I start with the idea of getting control over inflation. And as long as inflation stays elevated, it just makes the case to me we need to do more. Further tightening monetary policy should help restore balance between demand and supply and bring inflation back to 2% over the next few years. They will come down, I think. Uh, that's my, my baseline, but uh, they probably won't come down quite as fast as uh, markets would like. It will take some time, but I'm fully confident that we'll return to a sustained period of price stability. Very supportive of a path that is slower, uh, probably longer, and potentially higher than where we were. Only recently moved into restrictive territory, and we're going to have to move farther in order to keep uh, uh, inflation under control. I think we'd probably have to stay there uh, all during 2023 and into 2024. Well, Fed officials, they're stressing that they will raise borrowing costs further to curb inflation. Now, let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First word news, here's Laura Ryan. Hi, Laura. Hi, Francine. China says it's going to ramp up COVID vaccinations for senior citizens, a move regarded by health experts as crucial to removing tough COVID zero curbs. But Beijing stopped short of announcing mandates for compulsory jabs. Last night saw a heavy police presence deployed in major cities, which prevented a repeat of the weekend's protests over anti-COVID measures. Christine Lagarde said she would be surprised if Eurozone inflation had peaked. The ECB president's comments suggest the central bank's recent ramp-up in interest rates is not close to being over. Speaking to lawmakers in Brussels, she also warned growth will continue weakening into next year. UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says the so-called golden era of British relations with China is over. In his first major policy speech, Sunak said Beijing cannot simply be ignored, especially on issues such as global economic stability or climate change. He says the UK will work with allies to manage what he called sharpening competition with China. Hawaii's Mauna Loa, the largest active volcano on Earth, has erupted for the first time in nearly four decades. Local officials issued opened emergency shelters after the volcano began erupting late Sunday, blanketing the sky with ash. Officials have not issued evacuation orders and air traffic remains unaffected. 
Global News 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. This is Bloomberg for Unseen. Laura, thank you so much. Laura Wright in London. Now, let's also look at what Juventus is doing. The share price for Juventus dropping after the chairman, Andrea Agnelli, and the entire board has resigned. Now, this is a pretty dramatic exit. It follows an investigation uh, by the public prosecutor's office in Turin and Consob, Italy's market regulator, into some of the football club's recent financial balance sheets regarding alleged false accounting and market manipulation, something that the club has denied. Uh, he, they have denied any wrongdoing. Just a reminder, Juventus currently ranked third behind Napoli and AC Milan in Italy's top football league, that's Serie A. In the meantime, this is what the markets are doing, a bit of a liftoff for these European stocks. Uh, they opened higher. Nationwide unrest in China over COVID curbs seem to be easing, and that's boosting sentiment for riskier assets. Coming up, we go live to the World Travel and Tourism Council Summit in Riyadh to discuss post-COVID travel trends and expansion plans with ACOS chairman and chief executive. This is Bloomberg. Your top stories today, risk returns, a rebound in Chinese shares actually pushes global stocks higher as unrest over COVID curbs eases amid a heavy police presence. Tightening tilts, Fed officials stress the need for more hikes to break scorching inflation, even if at a slower pace. Plus, Musk rounds on Apple, the billionaire owner of Twitter, attacks the iPhone maker in a flurry of tweets, risking ties with the top advertiser. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, leisure companies have been seeing travel rebound post-COVID, but rising inflation also presents a challenge for the outlook. Let's go straight to Bloomberg's Yusuf Gamal Din, who's at the World Travel and Tourism Council Global Summit in Riyadh. So, Yusuf, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Fran. Uh, just that uh, people left and right, real buzz that continues to build here uh, at the WTTC. I'm happy to say that uh, we've been having quite a few conversations with top brands and we need to add another brand to them. That is, of course, Accor. Uh, very pleased to be joined. Oh, man, the last one. By, yeah, you're best for last. <laughs> right? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Chairman and CEO uh, Sebastian is a, a good friend, of course. Uh, talk to me about this uh, whole concept of a pent-up demand because I'm getting a bit tired of it. Because <laughs> everybody is basing their outlooks for the end of this year on pent-up demand, how much of that is really going to carry through to 23 and 24? Well, we're pretty convinced it's going to be carrying at least for the first quarter yeah. of 2023. First semester, I don't know, 2024, I have no idea. No, seriously, with what's happening in the world, with inflation, with maybe recession, thank God we had a good 2022. I think we're going to have a good first semester 2023. And then the odds are, we all, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, but I'm a true optimist, so it's, uh, it was better recovery than we expected, stronger demand. And so it should be carrying on as long as people have the wherewithal to travel and money to spend on leisure. You've made some big bets on China, as have many others in yes. the industry. Uh, you've seen the images over the weekend coming through in terms of the protests, the zero COVID policies. Yeah. How does that weigh on your outlook for the new year? I mean, how... how I mean, does that change anything for you at the moment? What are you hearing? No, it's too late to change anything anyhow. So I guess you just have to make a long time bet on China. We've been in China for 45 years. So another year, year and a half of hiccup, I can cope with this. So, uh, I mean, you know, Chinese, I, we need the Chinese travelers to come back outside of China, but we haven't seen them for the last three years. So we probably won't see them until summer at best. Good news is the Chinese hospitality market is today in the hands of 93% Chinese customers and it works. It actually works better than I expected myself. So I need to try Chinese outside of China, but I'm probably okay with Chinese remaining closed for the international travelers. Now, a lot of uh, CEOs have been coming here to Saudi Arabia to try and uh, sign additional deals to, I guess, make up for weakness elsewhere. Uh, have you been able to make any new progress? I know you've already got quite a bit in the pipeline. Well, we move, first of all, to, uh, you said, we're moving from the doom and gloom of Europe to come here to recharge the energy as if you were going to Singapore. That's what you said. That's what I'm, I'm actually beginning to get a kind of actually supplemental energy. No, there is a lot of momentum here. 
and I get real in Saudi Arabia here, and we talked about it. I've never seen a country in my life in which you have a leader, a plan, a vision, geography, financial resources, and expertise and access to brands. So what's happening here probably never happened in the world for the last 20 years. So we just want to be a participant, but you know who I am. I hate to be a spectator, so I want to be an actor of my own life. So I just want to participate, collaborate, and be useful. But I went, but go to Abu Dhabi, go to Dubai, go to Qatar. They're doing superbly well as well. So what kind of deals might you be looking at here? I mean, in terms of I'm trying the expansion to into the kingdom. I'm uh, deals. Uh, I'm trying to convince everybody that we have to shift the mindset from targeting to travel to target to local. So I want the Accor hotels tomorrow to be really designed for the local community. Because if you said use the Saudi in Saudi Arabia, the travelers will pick and choose your hotel because it's a buzzing uh, destination. So just reshifting our own mindset. But here, I'm going to go from mid-scale to premium to resort. Uh, we are all over. Uh, yeah. I, I need to be stronger. I am, I'm going to drag you to uh, you know, rainy and, and cold Europe for a moment, just to get your yeah. view yeah. on the room rates that keep pushing higher. Is that sustainable you know, in light of the impact of a recession that is still very much uh, rippling through the economy? Well, the, um, I think France is going to be avoiding recession. I'm not an economist, but I guess we're so much of a subsidized country. When it goes very well, we don't go very well. When it goes very bad, we don't go very bad. So France should be out of recession. UK, unfortunately, might be. It's, um, it's one of those things where we've been coping with minus 80% occupancy for two and a half years. Every time there's a recession in the world, minus three, minus four, RevPAR goes almost to the same uh, indexes, which is minus three, minus four. I can tell you, we can cope super well with a minus 3% activity when you've been going through minus 80%. So I don't wish for it, but we will adapt for it in a much better manner than we ever did in 2008, 2009. The variable that uh, all of us have had to deal with is inflation. And now you've got a bit of experience in handling inflation. In retrospect, what conclusion do you take in terms of implications for room rates and occupancy rates? Well, what has the impact been? Well, the impact of it, we've done the mathematics for our core. If we increase our own price per room by 5%, that means we can actually afford probably a 7 to 8% recession on energy and on payroll. So it's only 5%. Can I meet 5% uplift in 2023? I think I am. But the same token, you know, we are hotel operators. We don't own the assets anymore. So I have to admit, most of the burden is on the asset owners as opposed to the uh, hotel operators. So, but I'm not going to be blind about it. I'm going to be, I'm trying to cope with it with my own owners, but it's much more, it's less of my problem than some of my asset owners' problem. But again, in hindsight, Accor have a huge procurement activity. We do five, five billion of buying. We've been buying energy for 60% of the network up to 2024. So they would not see any energy inflation because of what we've been basically pre-buying a year and a half ago. Seb, you're going through a reorganization internally. I'm yes, wondering to what extent there's room for further job cuts as part of that reorganization, Zero. given the reality that Zero. you're seeing we in the are, economy, no? You said I'm missing 40,000 people within my 280,000 people organization. So don't even think about a job cut. I need people back at our core. Uh, that reorganization is only trying to have better expertise, more focus in the right segment. So we're splitting ACO in two autonomous divisions, ECO mid-scale premium and one on luxury lifestyle. It happens to be different segments, different owners, different clients. And I was dumb not to have done it earlier. Uh, probably did not do it because I didn't have the skill, ability to do it. Yeah. But it's indispensable and it's live on the 1st of January. And sense of ownership from my executive team is far better than I ever expected myself. It's going to work extremely well, but you will not be at any job expense. Sebastian, uh, always a fan of our conversations, uh, very uh, candid discussions. Thanks again for your time. That's uh, Sebastian Bazin, Thank the uh, CEO and Chairman of Accor, joining us here to WTTC in Riyadh. Yusuf, thanks so much. Yusuf Gamaldin at the World Travel and Tourism Global Summit in Riyadh, uh, there with the Accor Chief Executive. Now, coming up, we speak to the man tipped to be the next deputy leader of South Africa's governing African National Congress. Paul Mashatil joins us next after the break. This is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on Francine Lacqua here in London. Now let's get straight to your Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Laura Wright. Hi, Laura. Hi, Francine. EasyJet says enduring demand for discounted flights should allow it to return to pre-pandemic levels of capacity by next summer. That's as the UK-based budget airline narrowed its headline pre-tax loss for the year to the end of September to £178 million. Pounds. Coming into this uh, to this year with uh, you know a, a record bounce back, it's a, it's a billion pound bounce back that we did, and we achieved also the highest earnings ever in the the last quarter in the company's history. So what we're seeing now for this winter going forward is that that the the, the peak periods are doing really well. Crypto lender BlockFi has filed for bankruptcy, becoming the latest digital asset firm to collapse in the wake of the FTX fiasco. BlockFi says it will use the Chapter 11 process to focus on recovering all obligations owed to BlockFi by its counterparties, including FTX. The firm has asked clients to refrain from depositing more funds. A fight seems to be brewing between Twitter and Apple after Elon Musk accused the iPhone maker of threatening to keep the social network off the App Store. Musk also says Apple has cut advertising on Twitter, which he acquired last month. Apple has been one of Twitter's top advertisers, with a spend said to be above $100 million a year. That's the Bloomberg Business Flash from Scene. Laura, thanks so much. Now let's turn to South Africa. The economy is likely to have averted a technical recession in the third quarter despite record power outages. Now reviving a struggling economy and dealing with embattled state-owned power utility ESCOM will be of course key issues as a ruling African National Congress Party's leadership race kicks off next month. Now the ANC is battling to rebuild support after its vote dipped below 50 percent for the first time ever in the municipal election last year. Now this comes as the party looks to protect its majority in 2024's general election. Well joining us now is Paul Mashatil, Treasurer General for the uh, South African ruling African National Congress. Mr. Mashatil, thank you so much for joining us. Now, the governing ANC will also hold its elective conference next month. The t you know, it's no secret that the party has been dogged by some internal fighting or internal divisions. Have those been addressed? How are you expecting the Congress to go? Well, of, of course, it's going to be a <coughs> very challenging period for us. Uh, we are going into this conference uh, prioritizing uh, the unity of our members, all our structures. Uh, and that's why the theme of conference is unity and renewal. Uh, we want to come out of that conference uh, very strong, united, so that we can tackle the challenges that uh, the country is facing. Uh, as you have been saying just now, that we have the uh, challenges with uh, our state-owned enterprises, particularly the likes of ESCOM, uh, which leads to challenges like load shedding. So yes, uh, serious challenges, and it will need, uh, a, a, you know, a leadership that is yeah. united, the leadership that can pull together. Mr. Mashatil, you, you've also received the most nominations for the post of deputy president. What kind of things are you promising in terms of energy, in terms of unemployment, in terms of inflation? Well, I think the important thing is to get the economy right and get it uh, right faster. Uh, the ANC has got a lot of good policies. Uh, so our focus should really be on implementation. I think we need to make sure that uh, uh, we implement and implement much faster because if we get the economy right, we can create employment, uh, particularly amongst young people. Um, so it will need uh, that we sort out uh, challenges of ESCOM, look at other state-owned enterprises like your Transnet, Prasa. We're going to be putting a lot of resources uh, to drive uh, infrastructure development. There was a lot of promises at the conference five years ago, uh, nationalizing the central bank, establishing a state bank and a change to the constitution to make it easier to seize land without compensation. None of those have happened. Are they still on the agenda? Indeed, uh, as, as you say, the conference uh, in 2017, the 54th national conference, did take a decision to nationalize the central bank. Uh, there were challenges in, in, in government, and that uh, uh, was not uh, really done. Uh, so you might find that the debate will, will come back. 
Uh, my view is that uh, uh, we should uh, allow the debate to take place, but we, we should emphasize the fact that we do want a central bank uh, which will continue with its independence no. as guaranteed by the Constitution. Do you see the ANC retaining its majority into the 2024 election? And actually, you know, simp simply put, what can you do better to make the lives of all South Africans easier in the future? Yes, the, the ANC uh, at the moment uh, is uh, uh, strong enough to retain its, its uh, majority come 2024 elections. We're working well with uh, our alliance structures and, and, and our structures on the ground. So we're going into that election uh, to win decisively. Uh, and, no. and that's where we're putting all our efforts. But, but there are some key metrics where South Africa has gone backwards in terms of hitting those metrics. I'm talking about you know, the poverty line, uh, people who are unemployed and below the poverty line. So specifically, what can you put in place to make sure that the most vulnerable are protected? Well, as you know that we, we have uh, uh, approved at the government uh, level some uh, relief uh, mechanisms, some grants. But also, I think it's important that we put all efforts to, to drive economic growth and have a public uh, service that uh, is geared towards service delivery. That's why government has introduced a, a new mechanism to ensure that uh, there's a new national framework on public service with people who are well-trained, who are skilled, to be able to deliver efficiently. Um, Mr. Mashatil, when you look at some of the things that you know, we, we focus on, and you do believe that the ANC will win an outright majority, if it doesn't, who are you ready to be in coalition with in 2024? Well, we have decided that we should focus on winning the election uh, because uh, for us it's important. We think co coalitions are a problem. If we look at what's happening in local government at the moment, a lot of instability. Uh, we will cross the bridge when we come to it if we, we are in that situation where we need to consider collision. But for now, uh, we're fighting to win. Uh, how much of a problem is dollar strength? How much of a problem is? Is a strong dollar given for, well, for emerging markets in general, but for South Africa in particular? Well, as, as I said, uh, as, as the ANC at the moment, we, we are trying to fix uh, uh, our economy, fix what's happening in government. We're going to focus on implementation. And come next year, we're starting our campaign to win the general election and win it decisively. Uh, so for now, we're really not entertaining uh, coalitions, uh, so to speak. All right, thank you so much, uh, Paul Mashatila, uh, Treasurer General of the African National Congress, uh, joining us this morning. Now, coming up, as Russia continues to target Ukraine's vital infrastructure, we're live from Bucharest, where NATO foreign ministers are gathered to discuss developments in the war. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, NATO foreign ministers are gathering in Bucharest for an extraordinary meeting as Russia intensifies attacks on Ukraine's energy infrastructure, plunging the country into darkness and freezing temperatures. Now, for more, we go to our Maria Tadeo, our European correspondent who is in Bucharest. Maria, what exactly is topping the agenda? 
Yes, Francine. Well, a lot on the agenda, but also the significance of this movement and this location in particular. Because, Francine, I'm sure you remember back in 2008, the Bucharest NATO meeting. That was the first time the Ukraine membership uh, to NATO was put on the table. And, of course, we know the story. More than 10 years later, there's no membership for Ukraine, and there's now a full-scale war going on in the country. Now, today already we heard from the NATO Secretary General, Francine, who says there are needs to be a comprehensive package for Ukraine. He's pleading allies for this package, which of course includes military equipment, but he says there needs uh, also other issues like fuel, medical supplies, but also, and he really emphasized this point, winter equipment that can help the country. He says Ukraine is, quote, facing now a horrific winter. We know their energy infrastructure has been severely uh, compromised. The country is in darkness. And of course, you're starting to see now temperatures go below zero. A terrible winter, yeah. of course, for the civilian population in Ukraine. So, Maria, wh what about China? China is also going to be debated. Uh, yes, Francine, and I'm happy you mentioned and stressed that point because the Secretary General today in some of the briefing comments uh, that he made still highlighted and reiterated NATO needs to be alert and aware about the issues when it comes to security in China. And remember, it's no coincidence this year NATO changed its definition of China, which is now, quote, a challenge to the NATO Security Alliance. He says this is not a threat to China. It's just an obvious manifestation station that China is a competitor when it comes to cybersecurity. He also says Chinese uh, companies have been trying to really bid into the European market of critical infrastructure. He also mentioned 5G and repeated NATO members have to be extremely alert when it comes to China. Thank you so much, our Maria Tadeo. They're covering NATO's meeting today in Bucharest for us. Now, the other story on the corporate side is, of course, what's happening with Juventus. Uh, Juventus dropping in today's trading session. I think we have a board that we can actually put up to look at what exactly it's been doing. It was down some 10 percent, then down 4 percent, now down 2 percent. Now, the story there is allegations of wrongdoing. We know that we need to wait for the investigation. We know that uh, not only the chairman, but the whole board actually resigned. Uh, Juventus plunged into crisis after the chairman and the entire board resigned into alleged wrongdoing related to the company's last three-year financial filings. Now, this is a pretty dramatic exit. It follows an investigation by the public prosecutor's office in Turin, but also an investigation by CONSOB into these market regulator into some of the football club's recent financial balance sheets regarding alleged false accounting and market manipulation. The club has denied any wrongdoing. European stocks overall open higher. They continue the push higher as nationwide unrest in China over COVID curbs eased. That's boosting sentiment for riskier assets. The other thing we need to watch out for, and I'm looking at euro dollar, but a lot of the movement is actually on European yields is that Spanish inflation eased for a fourth month and by more than expected. That is reinforcing expectations for a wider slowdown in European prices, and it could also offer some comfort to the government whose aid measures have brought record budget spending. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Matt Miller, Kaylee Lyons in New York, our Anna Edwards here in London, and this is Bloomberg. start with the idea of getting control over inflation. And as long as inflation stays elevated, it just makes the case to me we need to do more. They're counting the first 250 basis points as if that was a tightening of monetary policy, and we're going to have to move farther. It will take some time, but I'm fully confident that we'll return to a sustained period of price development. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 6 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. The Fed makes it clear more rate hikes are on the way. Policymakers stress that borrowing costs must rise in the fight against inflation. 
China clamps down. Beijing responds to widespread protests by putting more police on the streets and censoring social media. We have news on COVID. And Elon Musk picks a fight with one of Twitter's top advertisers. He's asking whether Apple hates free speech and criticises its app fees. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kayleigh Lyons in New York. And clearly a focus on the Fed narrative, a focus on tech, uh, tech majors such as uh, Twitter and Apple, Kayleigh. But from a market perspective, we had been pretty obsessed with what was going on with China over the last 12 hours or so. That has faded a little bit, though, that, COVID, that uh, China COVID boost in European markets. Yeah, well, we have definitely seen a big boost in the Asian session, even if it is fading in Western markets, Anna, because all of that unrest in the protests around COVID uh, lockdown seemed to have calmed down in part because of the government response and a heavy police presence, which was aimed at cracking down on that. But you also seem to have concessions from Beijing. They're going to up vaccinations for people uh, 80 and over, plus maybe reduce some of those testing requirements. So all of that together, lifting risk sentiment in Asian markets, specifically for Chinese stocks, the Hang Seng China Enterprise Index, up more than 6% overnight and an even bigger move for technology stocks with the tech index up about 7.7%. And that's rippling through to foreign exchange as well. The offshore Chinese yuan, one of the biggest outperformers against the dollar among Asian currencies, strengthening by nearly a full percentage point. Seven, just shy of 7.18 is where we trade. And I wanted to point out the Chinese 10-year yield as well, up three basis points overnight to 290. We started the month of November at 266. So this has been a pretty sizable move. And that 10-year yield is now actually at its highest in about a year, Matt. All right, we're looking at drops uh, here in, as well in terms of uh, yields and really the dollar. I think that's the most interesting um, thing here. S&P futures up about two tenths of one percent. So, Anna, you're right. We have faded the gains that we saw earlier on hopes of China reopening at least sooner um, than previously had been thought, but still looking at gains. And I think that's because we are uh, losing the headwind of a strong dollar. In fact, a lot of people, J.P. Morgan uh, is one of the banks uh, out there saying maybe the dollar run is over here and we could start seeing new lows. That's why we see gains in European currencies. We saw that yesterday as well as today. NYMEX crude is up uh, 2% right now, but only to 78.84 a barrel. So a little bit of gain after the drop that we saw yesterday morning or Sunday night, we were looking at a 73 handle. So it's actually a pretty big jump from there. And then Bitcoin right now, about 2% as well. Still holding around 16,000 and a half right now, 16,517. So not a heck of a lot of movement there. What do you see in terms of the European fade today, Anna? Yeah, so we were looking at gains, Matt, across this European map uh, of around half a percent for some of the major markets. But those have faded, certainly in France and in Germany. The German market now down by around two tenths of one percent. We cling to the gains in London and London is up by six tenths of one percent. You'll see uh, that that is really to do with energy and energy markets, energy prices. It's to do with energy stocks and it's also to do with mining stocks. I'll show you where we are on those uh, particular stories. We have uh, Brent crude, of course, bouncing back from yesterday's losses. So whilst we've overall seem to have shaken off some of the enthusiasm, around the China reopening story. More on that in a moment. It does seem as if certain sectors are clinging to that theme and energy markets is one of those. 85.15 on Brent lost uh, substantial ground yesterday as a result of concerns around China protests. Uh, now gaining this morning on expectations that perhaps there'll be some reopening, further reopening of the Chinese economy and that is positive for crude. Basic resource stocks also helping out the London market then up by 2% this morning. And here's the Italian five-year yield. We've got uh, yields coming down across Europe and this is across the Eurozone. This seems to be quite a convincing move in today's session, particularly at the short end of the curve. It wasn't Italian data we got today. It was Spanish data. We just got one building block of the Eurozone inflation picture. But a lot of people asking, are we going to see a peak soon? Christine Lagarde saying she'd be surprised if we have peaked. Uh, it was the Spanish-Italian number, and it came in substantially below estimates. I put in the Italian market, though, because this is where we're seeing, of the G20, this is where we're seeing the biggest, most unusual outside move in markets. But that's where we yield uh, right now for Italian five-year debt. And keeping it Italian, this is a football club, a soccer club, based in Turin in Turin in northern Italy and the stock is down by just over three percent the Juventus uh, chairman and the whole of the board stepping down uh, some controversy around the way that players have been value valued in balance sheets it seems that there's now an investigation going on into the uh, last three years of financial filings for this business the company denies any wrongdoing Matt all right, well, we'll keep up with that story for sure. But um, main focus, I think, is going to be on the Fed. We got a host of Fed speak yesterday with policymakers stressing they will raise borrowing costs further to curb inflation. Inflation's been stubborner than, than I would like. Further tightening monetary policy should help restore balance between demand and supply and bring inflation back to 2%.
over the next few years. They will come down, I think. Uh, that's my, my baseline, but uh, they probably won't come down quite as fast as uh, markets would like. Very supportive of a path that is slower, uh, probably longer, and potentially higher than where we were. Only recently moved into restrictive territory, and we're going to have to move farther in order to keep uh, uh, inflation under control. Of course, tomorrow we're going to hear from Jerome Powell. So this is a very Fed-focused week. Bloomberg's Danny Berger joins us now to break down the details of what to expect. Danny? Yeah, Matt, it really feels like this last mile, this last push from the Fed before the blackout period begins. And I should say a hawkish push from them, which isn't necessarily surprising given financial conditions have loosened, stocks have rallied, treasuries have been bid. So maybe they want to undo some of that to keep inflation in check. I, I, I want to um, just pause on, the bull, on what Bullard said. We heard from him there uh, in uh, just a moment ago. But he was saying yesterday that markets are underpricing the risk that they're going to get more aggressive and stay there and said that the Fed needs to move to at least 5 percent. The market is going to have to do some repricing if it's going to factor that in. And you get Williams following up on that as well yesterday, um, saying that the path of inflation suggests that they will go higher. So what we have seen is a yield curve that continues to flatten, but it's been bullish flattening. In other words, it's been a bid into the long end. The front end hasn't really done much. Folks seem confident that we've reached cycle highs for the 10-year, for the 30-year. PIMCO, for example, is buying over there. But that two-year yield has essentially sleepwalked. So yesterday, we got a cycle low of about 81, negative 81 basis points in the twos, tens yield curve. Twos are at 4.4%. If they're going to get to that 5% that Bullard was talking about, Anna, they might have um, some readjusting to do leading up to this next Fed decision. Okay, but uh, still a little way to go until we get there. Danny, thank you very much. Big Danny Berger, building our way towards the last Fed meeting of the year. Now, in China, authorities have clamped down on protests against tough COVID restrictions with a heavy police presence in major cities. Meanwhile, the country plans to ramp up vaccinations for senior citizens, a move regarded by health experts as crucial to removing tough COVID zero curves. China's National Health Commission spokesman spoke earlier. We must correct the wrongful practices of arbitrary imposition of restrictions and provide services to people to meet their needs. We also advocate rapid and active vaccination particularly the elder population, so as to protect yourself and your family. Rebecca Chung Wilkins joins us now, Bloomberg Asia government and politics correspondent from Hong Kong. Uh, Rebecca, it did seem as if you could draw a line between the protest activity and this commitment from health officials uh, to hold accountable any uh, local policymaker who's too sort of overzealous in their application of the COVID rules. So, uh, you know, maybe that's a win for the protesters. A lot of focus also on the vaccination rate and driving that up amongst senior citizens. It does seem like we have seen quite a significant softening in tone from Chinese health authorities in particular, um, perhaps acknowledging in their own way, um, and at least, at the very least, acknowledging there is a need to respond to you know, what they've said as a re reasonable request uh, to tweak policy around COVID. Over the last few days, we've also continuously been hearding, hearing that sort of Chinese authorities are always constantly adjusting policies, again, sort of just opening the door up for potentially going forward with loosening policies here. Um, and as you say, uh, investors and markets very happy to see signs that China is going to be vaccinating and focusing on vaccinating its elderly population. That seemed to be a very sort of weak point uh, in its vaccination program that they will have to do if they want to reopen. At the moment, only about 40% of China's over 80 population has received their booster. Well, Rebecca, saying markets look happy with some of this almost seems like an understatement because we saw massive moves in Chinese equities overnight. How overdone does that seem? Well, it's part of a really big reopening trade that just before uh, the protests took off were roaring through Chinese assets, both uh, in Hong Kong and in the mainland as well. Um, there is a very sort of big bet that many people are taking that there will be significant reopening going into 2023. So the end of the first quarter, certainly going on into the second quarter. Um, it really ultimately, I think, though, depends on whether or not um, China can roll out an effective vaccine program. And of course, a lot of this is going to be decided by local governments. Central governments, of course, set the tone, but it's local governments who will have to take on the responsibility of potentially loosening 
loosening uh, and loosening things too early and then having to deal with the consequences and the pressures on their healthcare systems, for example. So there is both this issue of the central government setting policy, but also implementation, even once that comes through. And we are seeing now these sort of big spikes in cases across China. It's not like back in April where we saw really most of the cases in Shanghai, uh, Beijing, Guangzhou, Chongqing. These are big centers where cases really are rising in earnest now. Mm. Yes, just getting some headlines across the Bloomberg. Rebecca saying uh, Beijing reports, uh, uh, well, earlier saying that they'd reported a number of COVID cases and saying that uh, 23 makeshift COVID hospitals are in use. Things are changing fast, it seems, in China. Rebecca Jung Wilkins joining us there with the latest news on the COVID fight. Let us get to some news from the tech sector coming uh, to us overnight. Billionaire Elon Musk is publicly attacking Apple in a battle that pits the owner of Twitter against one of the company's top advertisers. Musk says that Apple has cut its Twitter advertising and threatened to block the social network from its app store. Uh, for more, let's uh, speak now to Bloomberg's Giles Turner, who uh, jo joins me on set here in London. Good morning to you, Giles. So explain um, how we've got to this point. Well, I mean, everyone loves a Twitter fight, first of all. I mean, we've got the world's Even richest... Even when it involves Twitter. Exactly. I mean, we've got the world's richest person against the world's biggest company, so, you know, I think it's going to be pretty epic, and we get to how epic in a bit. But really, this is about Twitter making money, right? They want to charge everyone $8 for using Twitter. If you're going to charge that money, then Apple's going to get 30% of that. So $2 for, I think. So he doesn't, want to, he doesn't want to have that because he needs to make money. Twitter has made money for a long time. I mean, he makes plenty of revenue, but not much profit, right? Or hardly any. So he's got to solve this problem. And one way to do it is try and claw back some of that $2 for, for every user. Mm. So, you know, we keep asking this question ever since Elon Musk took over or really kicked off his bid. What kind of risks does it have to Twitter's ability to operate at all? Well, I think even if it gets banned, for example, let's go for worst case scenario, you and me can still use Twitter. You won't get any new users, but everyone else can still use it. There also is a way around it. You can still, uh, the revenue problem that is, you can still avoid, you know, um, having, Twitter can still avoid paying that $2 for to Apple if you download it from, from their website, for example. But really, I think it's a great opportunity for Musk to, to have a fight with, you know, with the regulators on his side for once. We've been talking a lot about how he's had plenty of issues with regulators, especially around safety, because obviously he slashed the workforce by 50%. But regulators and lawmakers, both in Europe and the US, they really don't like the fact that Apple charges this 30%. It's a gatekeeper problem, and they don't really want that, they don't want it to happen. Now, they had a huge fight, um, Apple and Epic Games, the, the company behind Fortnite right. back in 2019 that lasted for a few years about this 30% problem, uh, and Apple won, right? Maybe on a technicality, but they still won. They can still charge 30%, right? This, we might see this fight happen all over again, and maybe the result will be different. Right. I mean, charging 30%, it should be said on the app store that they invented um, to put an app on the phone that they also produce. So uh, it's inter interesting to say the least. Giles, thanks so much for joining us. Bloomberg's Giles Turner talking to us about Twitter v. Apple. In other uh, TMT news, Disney's returning CEO Bob Iger has told employees at a company town hall that he'll look into some of his predecessors' more controversial decisions. One of those is requiring reservations for guests attending theme parks. Iger also said he'll focus on profitability in streaming and shot down a rumor about a possible merger between Disney and Apple, calling it pure speculation. All right, Matt, and Disney shares right now up about four tenths of 1% in pre-market trading. So let's take a look at some stocks moving to a larger degree in pre-market here in the U.S. And a lot of them are in the energy sector. Of course, these stocks were under some of the most pressure in the selling of yesterday, but they are rebounding this morning as we see oil moving higher. Halliburton, ConocoPhillips, Occidental Petroleum, all up in the bar ballpark of 1.5 to 2.8%. Another group of stocks that is moving higher is those Chinese technology companies that have listings here in the U.S., really following on the rally we saw in the Asian session overnight. Alibaba, Baidu, JD.com, all higher to the tune of 5.6 and even 7 and a quarter percent in the case of JD. One stock moving to the downside, though, is Roku. This is after an analyst at KeyBank cut his rating on the stock, saying that the consensus is too optimistic for both 2023 and 2024. And as a result, Roku shares down about 2.6 percent before the bell, Anna.
OK, we'll keep an eye on that one. Coming up on the programme, we'll discuss the economic impact of the unrest in China and the policy response around COVID-19 that we've uh, heard overnight from Chinese authorities. Diana Choi Labour joins us, Inodo Economics Chief Economist. And on the markets, Sharon Bell, Goldman Sachs European Equity Strategist, joins us. What does she make of the latest inflation data out of Europe? A question we'll also put to Irene Tin Tinagi, who is the chair of the European Parliament's Committee on Economic and Monetary Affairs. She was hearing this week from Christine Lagarde. What does she make of the testimony of the president of the ECB? We'll get to that conversation and talk crypto with her as well. This is Bling Bag. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lyons here in New York. Anna Edwards with us out of London. Let's get back, though, to China right now. Health officials are sounding a conciliatory tone a day after police blocked more protests against the COVID restrictions there. They said excessive curbs should be avoided and questions about how COVID is being handled should be resolved quickly. Joining us now is Diana Choileva, chief economist at Inodo Economics. And Diana, you know, yesterday it seemed as if the protests would only um, strengthen the resolve of the party to lock down the country in the face of COVID. Now it looks like um, they're offering a bit of an olive branch. How do you see it? I see this as a, the most minute olive branch, really. Um, and market uh, optimism seems misplaced at this stage. The Chinese authorities first reaction was to make sure that they ramp up their propaganda apparatus and clamp down on social media and the dissemination of information, but as well uh, as that on uh, the protest, as you said. And they seem to uh, have the upper hand uh, in, in the system that China has. It's extremely difficult for these protests to um, gain momentum momentum, the, the levels of control and the use of technology uh, in achieving it uh, are um, pretty extraordinary. D Diana, why is the party, why is Xi Jinping so intent on um, this incredibly draconian COVID zero policy rather than, you know, um, using uh, using vaccines that work from the West or letting the disease run its course? He's in a difficult position, a uh, really, really tight spot. And actually, the protests are making his situation worse because he would have been much more willing to relax uh, the zero COVID policy more substantially on the basis of the economy underperforming and really struggling. The problem he faces now is that these protests are linking uh, the lockdowns with a more generalized pushback against increased authoritarianism in China, which really the COVID lockdowns brought down to the everyday life of the Chinese in a way that they haven't had. So now that there is this linkage and the protests are directly uh, against the very top rather than the local governments, uh, she's actually facing an even worse dilemma of how to uh, exit from the zero COVID mm. strategy without say without losing face, and if you get Western vaccines uh, or you change dramatically your policy and start accepting significant debts that they will have to yeah. have, uh, then that is really untenable from from a political perspective. Can I ask you, as, a, as an economist then, Diana, what kind of assessment do you make as to how long it will take China to open up? If you think about the things that will be important here, the vaccination rate, uh, the, the, the number of ICU beds that are available, and the death rates that China is prepared to tolerate from this, how long does it take to China to lift all of the COVID rules? Look, China is in a kind of a slow motion, real economy crisis. Clearly, they're ramping up... Uh, uh, monetary stimulus and uh, debt-fueled investment, but that's really hitting against uh, not just the lockdown uh, dislocations and disruptions and the, the devastating impact that these lockdowns have on consumer spending, but also actually on uh, 
the fact that China really is, is over indebted and can't afford this debt fuel growth for much longer. It certainly is going to get a lot less bang for its buck. So the economy is in a really tough spot and she doesn't have a clear cut exit strategy. Uh, and any exit strategy will involve mm -hmm. continued economic pain. So this is um, a situation that I think that the, the, the way markets are reacting today, it's, it's very surprising, given that uh, what the Chinese came up with uh, this uh, overnight was, was a lot, uh, one could argue, even weaker than the 20-point relaxation that they had earlier, which yeah. we also described as, as just tweaking. Well, we are continuing to get headlines out, Diana, from China. Beijing's Chaoyang district says that elderly and kids can skip daily COVID tests, so maybe some degree of relaxation there. We've talked a lot about kind of the near to medium term impact on the Chinese economy, but I'm wondering about longer term effects. How much damage has been done to China's reputation as a place for companies not based there to produce their goods, like Apple, for example, is the one that comes to mind, or really just as a partner in trade? That seems much longer lasting as companies look to reshore well uh, this is part of the general great decoupling theme that has been our key investment theme over the last um, uh, three years the bifurcation of the world into two spheres of influence a US and a China one and uh, COVID and China's response to COVID has exacerbated that split and actually what China is doing right now is damaging its reputation as a, a reliable trading partner, uh, which is adding to the geopolitical concerns that are causing uh, reshoring and the great decoupling. And there's a huge question about what that means for the growth and inflation trajectory in the global economy. Diana, we have to leave it there, but thank you so much for joining us with your insight. That's Diana Chueleva of Anoto Economics. Now keeping you up to date with other news from around the world, let's get the first word. A bill in the U.S. Senate protecting same-sex marriage has cleared another procedural hurdle. A vote on final passage could take place this afternoon. If it passes, the measure then goes to the House. The bill would recognize same-sex marriages under federal law and ensure benefits for all married couples. Former Vice President Mike Pence is calling on Donald Trump to apologize for having dinner with a white nationalist. In a TV interview, Pence said the former president showed profoundly poor judgment. Last week, he dined at his Mar-a-Lago resort with rapper Ye and white supremacist Nick Fuentes. President Biden and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi are moving to prevent a strike that would shut down the nation's freight railroads. The House is preparing to take up legislation to impose a labor settlement despite the objections of some unions. A rail strike could hurt the economy by crippling supply chains. And BlockFi has become the latest crypto firm to collapse in the wake of the downfall of FTX. The digital asset lender says it will use the Chapter 11 process to recover everything it is owed by its counterparties, including FTX. But BlockFi acknowledged that recoveries are likely to be delayed by FTX's own bankruptcy. So, Matt, another domino has fallen. It's one we all were largely expecting to fall, considering BlockFi already had its issues, got bailed out by FTX, then FTX itself needed a bailout. The question is, what's the next shoe to drop? We're still looking to see if Celsius got the funding it said it needed. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the BlockFi shoe... Genesis, rather. Uh, the BlockFi shoe was already... Um, had already dropped. Uh, I think it'll be... Very interesting, you're right, to watch what happens with Genesis and Gemini. I think that's what a lot of market participants are kind of holding their breath for. Um, BlockFi seemed beyond saving, the other two not mm. so much, Anna. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll get to the regulation conversation on this. We talked about this yesterday, didn't we? Talk about the, uh, the sort of regulatory arbitrage in different parts of the world and certainly the Europeans uh, plowing, uh, plowing ahead with regulation, the Mika framework. Do we need a Mika too? Christine Lagarde was talking about that just yesterday. Uh, before we get to that conversation, we will talk to Sharon Bell, Goldman Sachs, European equity strategist. What does she make of the London market right now? It outperforms on days like today when we see energy and mining stocks jump. Is that enough to get in and buy that market or do we need uh, further confidence in the UK infrastructure and UK, uh, the UK markets more broadly. We'll have that conversation shortly. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. The Fed makes it clear more rate hikes are on the way. Policymakers stress that borrowing costs must rise in the fight against inflation. China is making some quiet concessions on COVID limits a day after police blocked more protests. Authorities are easing up on some restrictions and also pushing to bolster vaccination among its senior citizens. And Elon Musk picks a fight with one of Twitter's top advertisers. He's asking whether Apple hates free speech and criticizes its app fees. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York. And Matt, uh, global markets, risk appetite was wobbling a little half an hour ago. I don't think it was anything we did, but it seems to have recovered slightly. Uh, it was pushed along overnight by the better news out of China, it seems. Yeah, slightly better news, right? I liked how Diana Troileva put it earlier. She said it's a minute olive branch. You really have to squint to see those concessions but as we know the markets uh, love to front run good news they want to get it before everyone else does so when it's not there sometimes they um, kind of make it up in any case we're looking at S&P futures gaining about a third of a percent right now we did close down one and a half percent yesterday in the cash trade down below back below 4,000 so we're trying to claw some of that back the Bloomberg dollar index which you know the strength a month ago or two months ago had been a real headwind for equities has dissipated quite a bit and it continues to come down with a number of banks saying they now think um, that their bullish bets should be reversed on the dollar. So you can see gains in the euro uh, and other currencies against the greenback. Right now, 1273 is the BBDXY. NYMEX crude coming up a bit, 2.7%. Uh, Maybe this is on reopening uh, hopes for China now up to 79.33. And remember, we saw a 73 handle early yesterday for WTI crude. So that's a substantial gain. And Bitcoin is up, but it's not terribly substantial. Still hovering around the same $16,000 level we've seen ever since the implosion of FTX right now trading at 16,499. Kaylee, what are you seeing in terms of pre-market movers this morning? Well, Matt, it may not be a massive move for Bitcoin, but it's still enough to give a little bit of a lift to crypto-related equities like the exchange Coinbase, which is actually higher by about 2.3% in early hours this morning, recovering some of its 4% loss yesterday that was in part spurred by the bankruptcy filing of BlockFi. Other stocks that are moving higher include most in the energy sector with the gains in oil that you were mentioning, Matt. Exxon is one of them, up about 1% in early hours. And then following on from the gains we saw in Asia, all of that optimism around the China news that you and Anna were just discussing, uh, we are seeing that some of those Chinese tech stocks that also have listings here in the U.S. are gaining. The ADRs of Alibaba up about 5.8% and JD.com up about 7.5% before the bell, Anna. We're seeing here in, K here in uh, Europe, Kaylee, then a bit of a bounce back from yesterday's losses for European equity markets. And this is all to do with uh, China and the reopening trade there, uh, getting people excited, rightly or not. So the stocks here are 600 up by three tenths of one percent. Brent crude is up by 2.9 percent, again, bouncing because of that change in the China dynamic overnight. Basic resources, one of the sectors doing well in London, up by 2.4 percent. That and energy names help to cushion the London market from any downside on a day like today uh, and helps the London market outperform. I've got the Italian five year yield here just to underscore what we're seeing on Italian debt markets today. We got the Spanish inflation number. The inflation number came in lower than had been expected. Uh, and so that has brought yields down across European markets. And this is a member of the G20 for you, just showing where we're seeing those yields coming down. But if you want to see the bigger moves, uh, Spain, Portugal, the yields there uh, certainly making some uh, making some uh, big, uh, big moves lower as a result of changing expectations about how much hiking the ECB has to do. We get the full ECB, oh sorry, Eurozone inflation print tomorrow. Well, Anna, let's continue the conversation about about the European economy and how it translates into an equity thesis. Joining us now is Sharon Bell, Goldman Sachs European equity strategist. Sharon, your colleagues at Goldman put out a note related to the U.S. economy and markets yesterday saying that essentially U.S. equities are not correctly pricing in the risk of a recession, which Goldman puts at about 39 percent probability in the next 12 months. They say equities are only reflecting about an 11 percent chance. What's the risk in Europe and is that appropriately priced? So I think the risk of recession in Europe is a lot higher. Um, in fact, we think that would be our base case, that you see a recession. We think Europe is, is in recession really now in the fourth quarter, um, and that will probably last into the first couple of quarters of next year. So I think the, the, the risk of recession is very much higher in Europe. Um, Europe doesn't have energy independence. We have very high inflation, even if it's starting to come down from these incredible high peak levels, and that's obviously causing a decline in real incomes. But... 
um, European equities are much um, less expensive than US equities. So the, the PE uh, for Europe is probably only about 11 or 12 times, whereas it's, say, 17 in the US. So um, I would argue that uh, a little bit more of um, weaker growth is priced into Europe than the US. But in both cases, we worry that cyclicals have bounced a lot. There's a lot of enthusiasm priced generally into global equities. And we think that's a little bit overdone. Okay, so maybe the economic growth story is more appropriately priced in. What about the earnings growth story? Are those expectations still too high? In our view, yes, on both sides of the Atlantic here. Um, in the U.S., we expect zero earnings growth for the S&P companies next year, um, which given sort of the trend rates that we've seen in recent years, high single digits, earnings growth has been quite typical for S&P 500 companies. Zero is going to feel pretty low. Um, and that's really because margins are still coming down. Companies are facing higher costs, labor costs, material costs, et cetera. And it's going to be trickier to pass those on to um, households and consumers when growth is slowing and, and pretty weak. And in Europe, a very similar picture. We're expecting actually earnings to fall next year by about 8% in Europe. That reflects the kind of gloomier picture we have for European economic growth. Um, and again, we think the consensus, which is still for a little bit of positive growth in Europe, is a bit too high. And the main difference between us and consensus is on margins. We think companies will face higher costs and it'll be trickier to pass those on. Sharon, good morning to you. What's the Goldman Sachs view on how should st substantially we should view the changes overnight from China on, on COVID zero? And I ask this, I know that your role in, in European equities, of course, will be watching this very, uh, your team will be watching this very closely because there are so many industrial businesses in Germany or luxury goods companies in, in France that have made so much money in China. So what is, what is the take as to whether these are really micro moves? It's the thin end of the wedge. It's the start of something that really uh, gains momentum in the spring and summer. So, look, absolutely, China is really important for European companies. And um, although I sort of painted a gloomy picture for the European economy, um, we do think Europe is in recession at the moment. European businesses, particularly the large listed ones, are global. Um, they make less than half of their money in Europe itself. Um, and China, in particular, is a big portion of sales and trade. Um, we sort of tot up the numbers and come up with about 10% China exposure for European companies. But it's probably even a little bit larger than that if you consider the interconnections with China globally are go very, very deep. Um, so China's recovery is really important and a move away from the kind of rolling zero COVID policy that we've seen is important. We think that, you, that the moves so far um, are really incredibly small on that front and it will take um, several more months. We probably won't see really a move away from zero COVID into perhaps the second quarter of next year. So the market is right to anticipate it, but perhaps again a little mm. bit too early in doing so. I saw some comments today and thinking about your view on the FTSE 100 or the FTSE 250, Sharon, it's a day like today where we see outperformance in London because of exposure, of course, to mining, basic resource, energy stocks. I saw a comment from the Lloyds Banking Group CEO, Charlie Nunn, earlier, who says that global investors are nervous about investing in the UK. Does that come up in conversations about UK equities? Absolutely, it does. Um, I, people are, are pretty happy with the concept that FTSE 100 is not very exposed to the UK. About a quarter of FTSE 100 sales are domestic to the UK, meaning three quarters outside the UK, lots of dollar earnings there, lots of China earnings, lots of global growth, lots of resources and commodity companies, obviously linked to China, therefore, but linked to the global growth generally and growth in the US. Um, there is a little bit more scepticism on uh, mid-cap businesses because they tend to be a bit more domestic. They also tend to suffer at times where you've got higher costs and higher wages. They tend to find that more difficult to pass on to their customers. I do think there will be recovery in the UK as we go through 2023, but at the moment it is a difficult patch and there is nervousness from global investors in investing in those kind of more domestic-focused companies in the UK. Are there recession-proof sectors or, or companies that you like, Sharon? I mean, companies don't tend to ever be totally 100% recession-proof, but I guess the businesses that tend to have the lowest beta, to, um, the economic problem, say, in the UK, would be global companies, would be um, healthcare companies in particular, um, would be companies which have got businesses which make a lot of dollars, um, things like uh, commodity companies, mining companies, oil companies. They suffer with economic downturns globally, but bear in mind there's a, a lack of supply in most of those areas. So they are still seeing quite high prices. And then finally, one thing about this downturn is it's coming with higher interest rates. Um, and higher interest rates is generally quite good for financials. So that's an, another area, perhaps of more resilience this cycle than has been typical. You're speaking at the Goldman Sachs 
resilient business event at Oxford. And I wonder, especially small businesses, um, how resilient can they be? So I, you know, in some ways, I'm surprised at how um, optimistic and resilient the small businesses um, are. The conference that, that I've been um, attending and speaking at, it's great to meet smaller businesses. Um, these are the people that are um, growing the economy. These are the entrepreneurs that are hiring, um, uh, creating jobs, creating growth for the economy. So, and they absolutely are aware that from a kind of big macro top-down angle, things are pretty bad. We have inflation. We have a cost of living problem in the UK. We have very weak growth. We are probably in recession. Um, but all those things also create opportunity as well, which they're looking for. And I think uh, we call this conference resilience because um, we think and businesses should be thinking more broadly about their resilience. We know there's a lot more volatility now, um, given the scarcity of labor, given the scarcity of energy, given the scarcity of resources generally, it's going to be really important for businesses to be resilient. Yeah, and resilient to higher interest rates. Sharon, thank you very much. Sharon Bell joining us there from Goldman Sachs. Uh, thank you for your time. Coming up, we will talk to Irene Tinagli, who is the chair of the European Parliament's Committee on, Mon on Economic and Monetary Affairs. She was hearing yesterday from Christine Lagarde of the ECB. What does she take away from that conversation? We'll talk about monetary policy, inflation, also crypto. This is Bloomberg. In this environment of high uncertainty and with complex shocks hitting the economy, the Governing Council decisions will continue to be data dependent and follow a meeting by meeting approach. How much further we need to go, how fast we need to get there, will be based on our updated outlook, on the persistence of the shocks, on the reaction of wages and inflation expectations, and on our assessment of the transmission of policy stance. That was the ECB President Christine Lagarde, of course, speaking at a hearing before the European Parliament's Committee on Economic and Monetary Affairs just yesterday. Joining us now is the chair of that committee, Irene Tinagli. Uh, very good to have you with us on the programme then, Irene. Thanks for joining us. So we heard there from Christine Lagarde talking about inflation and, and growth and the like. How concerned are you about the inflation picture in the euro area? Are you comforted at all by numbers out of Spain today, which came in weaker than expected? What's your view on inflation? Well, the problem uh, with inflation in the euro area compared, for instance, with the inflation in the United States is that we have, uh, on one hand, uh, a peculiar kind of inflation, which is uh, mostly driven by energy prices that both directly and indirectly affect the inflation rates. Uh, and this is something that uh, unfortunately cannot be changed easily by just uh, hiking the interest rate. So uh, we need to have more comprehensive measures. And so uh, uh, this is one of the issues. And the other problem that we do have is the, and we discussed yesterday in the, in the hearing, uh, many different uh, inflation rates uh, inside the European Union. So you have countries, we have divergences, we have countries that have inflation rates as high as 22% and countries that uh, uh, have actually much, much lower, like in the range of uh, mm. 6 or 7%. So depending on the energy mix, depending on the measures that have been taken by the national member states, because we know that the response in these months has been very yeah. you know, different from uh, uh, state to state. So we need to be very careful in uh, trying to have responses that take into account uh, uh, this uh, heterogeneity and does not uh, increase the divergences but tries to have uh, a more convergent uh, uh, path. So okay. it, it is very complicated, but uh, we are, you know, scrutinizing and looking and monitoring what uh, is going Absolutely. on very closely. So I hear you, Erene, that there are different rates amongst the, the Eurozone countries. Are you concerned then that the ECB may be hiking rates into a recession? You know, this was uh, uh, some um, members of the parliament yesterday uh, indeed were concerned a little bit about that uh, because we know that we are 
walking on a fine line because uh, the economy is slowing down considerably. So uh, many uh, members of the parliament uh, ask questions about these. You know, how uh, are we sure? How can we find a balance? Uh, you know, by fighting uh, inflation with the traditional tools of monetary policy, which is the interest rate. But how do we make sure that this does not uh, accelerate or aggravate uh, the potential recession, considering that already the forecasts for growth for 2023 are close to zero in the, in the European Union. So uh, we have to be very, very careful. And I think, I hope this is also part of the strategy of the European Central Bank when uh, President Lagarde says we want to make decision uh, based on uh, data. I hope that this data includes not only inflation, but also the uh, stability and the, uh, you know, uh, uh, economic uh, uh, conditions and situations of the European Union. So all these data have to be taken into consideration uh, when uh, uh, some decisions about the interest rates are made. Uh, so that's why I think that the governing council is deciding step by step and not giving forward guidance in this uncertain scenario. I want to take you to crypto right now because you've got new rules in place. Uh, MICA, M-I-C-A, is the acronym for the new EU crypto rules. How would, um, for example, FTX have fared under a MICA regime? Would the blow up have been avoided? Well, this is actually subject of debate and uh, we will discuss it exactly tomorrow because we are having a hearing, a public hearing, so everybody can will be able to follow that in the Econ Committee of the Parliament. Uh, it's a hearing on the collapse of FTX and just trying to understand what happened because we are still uh, trying to understand and discover what really happened and uh, if the regulation, if the tools that we have negotiated just a few months Months ago, and that we are about to vote in the plenary uh, will be uh, would have been sufficient because they are still not in place. So the Mika regulation is still not uh, functioning. So we have negotiated it, we have uh, approved it in the Econ Committee, and uh, uh, but uh, now we have to go the, the final steps, and it will be in place later on. Would that set of uh, you know that toolkit? Uh, be enough to mm -hmm. prevent cases like the FTX. We will discuss it that tomorrow and, uh, and we will try to, to better understand what uh, went wrong because we need to make sure that things like this that, uh, don't happen again in the future. So if in those discussions, Arena, you find that they may not have been enough to prevent an episode like this, do you think the end result could be even tighter regulation going forward? Well, frankly, I, I, I don't think we are going to reopen what had been negotiating and approved and voted uh, uh, in the past year. But what I think is that, you know, when we talk about regulation, we always talk about ongoing process, especially when we are regulating emerging phenomena, new phenomena, we have to adopt a gradual approach, uh, trying to uh, regulate what we know about, uh, avoiding the over-regulation or avoiding, you know, things things that uh, uh, may not work. So we adopt a step-by-step -step approach again. And so we uh, did this regulation. Uh, I think it, it's a good uh, toolkit. We will evaluate this also at the test mm -hmm. of the new cases that are coming up in these weeks and the upcoming months. And we can always improve on that regulation as we normally do. So we normally do uh, reviews or quick fixes. So uh, regulations are not set in stone. We move forward when we mm -hmm. believe that certain regulations need to be updated uh, to address uh, upcoming uh, issues. So but it will be, of course, not up to me, but up to the parliament yeah. and uh, up to the uh, members of the parliament and the political group to evaluate and decide uh, how to proceed on the process of uh, better regulating the, uh, the crypto uh, asset uh, markets. So clearly a lot of different players involved in these conversations, Arene, but do you personally view crypto as having some kind of more systemic threat to financial stability, given the episodes we have seen, being that FTX was not the first collapse wave we have seen this year? Well, you know, it, it, it's still uh, maybe 
early to right now we are not seeing that systematic uh, effect uh, but also because it's a relatively new phenomena but we also see that it is on one hand it's been growing exponentially so potentially could become uh, a phenomena that uh, might have a systemic uh, effect uh, in cases uh, uh, of collapse uh, of certain platforms or uh, service providers etc like the ones we are seeing in these weeks so I think we need to be really really careful in monitoring uh, what what is going on and trying to put in place regulation that would prevent uh, that to blow up out of proportion and to become a systemic threat so for once we would like to uh, act before <laughs> the systemic uh, because you know in the past uh, we had to regulate after for instance during right. the great financial recession we had to add and put regulations in place after they collapse in the recession. So we would like to prevent that. Of course, mm -hmm. we would like to do that with all the information, with all the yeah. um, uh, elements that we needed to have a proper regulation. All right, so anticipating, not just reacting. Thank you so much for joining us, Arena Tanagli of the European Parliament's Committee on Economic and Monetary Affairs. We appreciate your time. And for more conversation on crypto regulation, tune into Bloomberg Crypto today at 1 p.m. New York time, 6 p.m. in London. It's our weekly show with Matt and I that shows uh, the people, the transactions and technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. We'll be hearing from crypto investor Aaron Brown and crypto skeptic John Reed Stark this episode. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lyons here in New York. Anna Edwards with us out of London. Let's take a look at what's ahead today. NATO foreign ministers have begun two days of meetings in Romania. We're also watching Germany for inflation data. That comes out at 7 a.m. Eastern, our time. At 10 a.m., we'll get U.S. consumer confidence data for November, as well as BOE Governor Andrew Bailey speaking in the House of Lords. So that's it for early edition um, from me, Anna, and Kaylee. Bloomberg Surveillance is ahead with Lisa, John, and Tom. I think they're all here. We'll hear from former New York President Bill Dudley, among others. This is Bloomberg.